What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the Quarantine Zone again. And on the phone, we got the one and only Jeff Scott Soto. Great to talk to you today, man. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for taking the time to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I actually spoke with you. I can't believe it's been two years ago now. But we spoke for a great, deep one and a half minutes at the Hall of Heavy Metal History. So it's great to be able to chat with you again. <laughs> well, two years in... in, in, in the terms of what we're dealing with right now, two years is nothing. <laughs> you know, we, we've basically been sitting for a year, and uh, it's as far as I'm concerned, I just I can't wait to get back to normal like everyone else. You know, we, we have a lot of life to catch up on. I know. You were actually one of the last performers I saw before the world ended uh, at the Sons of Apollo show at Gramercy Theater. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was a fun night. Yeah, that was a great night. Great night. The crowd was so into it. Super fun. You know, great songs live. It was It was a very positive night at the Gramercy Theater. Oh, yeah. I, I, I really, I always get nervous with uh, with the, I guess, the, the New York, the coast-to-coast the coast shows, the West Coast, East Coast shows, because especially the, the home shows in L.A., for me, they're just the pits. You always think... An artist wants to play their hometown, and it's so exciting, and they can't wait. All the friends and their family are there, and that's the problem. You're so talked out before the show, during the show, and after the show. You feel like you've done 15 shows in one night. Yep. So New York is no different because I have so much, so many friends there and so much family there still, and so many acquaintances. And then you have the, 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 the kind of the judgment that comes from playing in front of a New York crowd of you better be, you better kick ass. So they're going to look at you and think. Why did I pay for this? Yeah, I know those coast to coast shows. You know our hardcore roots, the West Coast hardcore and the New York City hardcore movement. It's 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 everywhere. It's in our DNA at this point. So yes. so we can't help the judgmental. We don't take it personally. No no no. Hey, I'm, I'm born in New York and raised in L.A. So believe me, I'm I'm part of that problem. <laughs> when I go see a band, I'm I'm just as guilty of that. Anyway. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. But we have the new Wet album, uh, Retransmission, coming out uh, January 22nd. I was just listening to the album. It's kick ass. Could the first singles that you uh, release off of this album, Big Boys Don't Cry and uh, Got to Be About Love, could that maybe serve as a clear representation of what the entirety of the Retransmission album is going to sound like? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a single is never indicative of a full album, of course. And we have some things on there that uh, if we release as first singles or, for, or second singles, they, they too might misrepresent the album. I think overall, by now, because this is album number four for us, I think people pretty much know what to expect for, from, from this band and from what we do together. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess those first singles could be indicative of, of what to expect from the album because bottom line, we're not changing anything. We're not, we're not trying to reinvent something that we actually created for this band. You know, it, for all intents and purposes, this band derives from three other bands and you can hear the influences of those different bands, especially as we continue into the future. Uh, I get, I always get, you know, I always get from, uh, from interviews or from journalists asking are we still chasing the momentum of the other bands that this band is made of? And it's the, the answer is absolutely not, because at this point, we've created a sound and a kind of a, a momentum that stands on its own valor now. And that does come from the other three bands that this band is derived from. So we're not really chasing the, the audience of those three bands as we're creating our own. We, we actually... It, it's just it's hand in hand we're going to get that audience as well as we're going to create our own audience and it's there's not too many people that are following this band that don't follow the other three bands that we're in Mm -hmm. So it's fair to say that what we heard on albums such as the 2009 self-titled or Rise Up or Earth Rage, like it is almost kind of like a continuation of the evolution of Wet in a way, right? With retransmission. Yeah, yes and no, and, and that a lot of a lot of the differences that are come that are coming from the different albums since the first album have a lot to do with the, the songwriting. For us, the songwriting is number one. It, the songs have to be unbelievable. From Every single song has to be something we all we all feel the same way about, whether we write them or not. And Wet is not necessarily a band that has to be like a Van Halen or a Queen, where we are the composers of every song. We're not going to do songs with outside writers. We strictly... Uh, want to get the best of what we can get out of this band and let our personal contributions make the band sound like the band and so from album number two 
and especially somebody like Eric, he was writing with other people and getting other influences, and there there are poppier, like more just uh, pop versions of what this man has become, based on him writing with other people that that write in that natural vein. There, I remember one of the albums, Eric came to me. He came to me with a song, and he said, "Man, you got to. I I think this might be a little too poppy for us." It, it, because the guy he was writing with is more of a like a Justin Timberlake kind of writer, or somebody who writes along the step, the, the lines of like an Ed Sheeran type of thing. And when I heard the song, not only was it a great song, I said, "Dude, I'm not worried about doing a song like this." Because in the end, the way I sing it, the the influence you guys bring in as far as guitar players and the overall production, it's still going to sound like us. It's not going to sound alien or that that it doesn't fit. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the key components to this is if we're going with outside writers and other influences from the outside, in the end, it still sounds like us. That's a good way of putting it. And it seems like all bets are off or all cards are on the table for it. It seems like you have a formula that works for you, but you're able to approach it from different angles to keep it exciting. Exactly. And we know the formula that works for us, that works for the label, and that works for the people who have been buying these records since day one. We know that we have a responsibility to, to those sides outside of our own. We, we do have a responsibility amongst within the band and, and amongst ourselves. But we also have that responsibility to deliver to the label what they expect of us, to deliver to the fans what they expect of us. And without going too far outside the box, we do exactly that. Awesome. And being that, you know, you are such a prolific artist who's played with many different bands, I know that you said that, like, you know, with Wet, that, like, you know, all of the members, you try to maybe put in your previous experiences aside and start fresh. But is it fair to say that with everything you've done between playing with Ingve and Sons of Apollo and Axel Rudy Pell and so many other great musicians, like, is it almost like a different mind frame depending on the project you're in? Or is there a usual maybe method behind the madness that, like, applies to everything? It's always the same mind frame because in the end, the, the DNA of what, how those songs are done and completed, it's all coming from the same source. So there's not a, it's not like I have to change hats or change shoes for, for, for the mindset of how to create a, a wet song or a wet album. I, it, it's all part of the same DNA. And as long as the, the bottom line is that the songs are king, it, it, there's, there's no real mindset that goes behind it. It's, it's, it all has to be natural and organic, otherwise it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be believable. Mm-hmm. Being a vocalist, because I feel like there's two components that make a frontman a frontman, or actually three if you if you're talking about the live show too, but there's lyrics and then there's the vocal range. Have you always needed the music to come up with the lyrics or have you ever had a lyrical concept or maybe even not a concept, but a vocal pattern written down and maybe the rest of the band would write according to that. I'm absolutely no Bernie Taupin. I'm not a a person who could just sit there and and jot lyrics and make, make them rhyme and make it put them in a format that they could be related to a song. Not there've been times where I've jot, I've heard a line from a movie or if I'm watching the news and somebody says something sarcastic or something that sounds clever. Of course I've, I've jotted those things down, but I've never actually sat and written a lyric. Even, even uh, uh, if it's a, a personal item of something I'm writing for somebody or for a certain person or for a certain reason, I've never just sat down to write something like that without having a piece of music to have it accompany it. Because I don't want the pressure of trying to fit something into something that it, no, it wouldn't naturally do. So you give me a piece of music without any melodies or any structure, or any reference, and things just start naturally coming out of me. When when I, when I hear it, I naturally start singing things. I, I could do that even with a song that we all know and love and, and we've heard for 20, 30 years already. You can give me Stairway to Heaven with no vocals and I might come up with something that completely different because that's just naturally what happens when I hear when I listen to music. Mel- melodies occur and things start happening over that body of music. And that's what I need to do to get to the lyrics. Be- before I get to any lyrics, I got to know what that song is about. I got to know what melodies are going to be accompanying that song. And then everything just starts happening naturally and organically. It almost feels like, and I'd imagine the music has to resonate with you on an emotional level in order for you to collaborate with it, right? Absolutely. Uh, The the music dictates where the actual lyrics or the theme is going to be heading towards uh, when I'm writing the lyrics. And if it's it's something like Sons of Apollo is a prime example, you listen to a, a piece of music, you know exactly what that that's going to be about you know exactly what to write about based on the feeling that you get from that piece of music 
Mm -hmm. And I also heard with people who sing that the instrumentation plays an influence on the range as well. Like, I mean, playing along guitar players who have many different talents, many different skills and many different signature sounds. I don't know if this is the right terminology to say it, but do you almost feel like you maybe have to adjust your voice to maybe how low the tuning is or how high the tuning of the guitars are or something like that? Absolutely. All of that is imperative uh, into what you're crafting behind it because, uh, and, and yeah, it, it's, luckily I've been blessed and this, I'm not patting myself in the back by any stretch. Luckily I've been blessed with a, a pretty wide range. So guitar players or songwriters don't necessarily have to think about or worry about a key or, or I'm going to write the song in this key because it's the only one that Jeff can sing in or that he can't sing lower or higher. <laughs> You can come to me with any piece of music, and I will find a way to adapt what's going to be over it based on uh, on the keys and the range of, of that I'm, I was blessed to be able to write in those in those terms. And with as you've worked with artists over the years, has every project you collaborated with maybe unlocked something or helped you discover new things about your uh, vocal style as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I do as much as I do. Uh, a, a lot of people, I've, I've been accused as being a musical prostitute at times because I'm on too many things and not focusing enough on just one thing. I, I can't just focus on one thing. I'm, I'm ADD when it comes to music. I love so many genres and I'm, well, so many different things make me click as a writer, as a musician. I could not be pigeonholed as doing one style of one genre of, of music. I, I, I just love music so much. I want to challenge myself. I want to add the different elements and the different influences I grew up with and that I'm still learning, that I'm still absorbing. I, you're never too old to stop learning and stop uh, being influenced by something. So, you know, when, when I'm doing new music, like, say, for instance, my band Soto, people say I'm jumping on a bandwagon. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. I'm doing something because I'm influenced by it. I want to try something that is, is actually making me tick the same way those things made me tick when I was 18 or 15 or 25 or 35. You're constantly a student absorbing as a sponge when it comes to music. And that's that, that should always be the uh, the rule that you you add behind yourself as an artist and you know it's great that like the, mu the uh, musicians and working with people inspire you in the music itself but when it comes to just writing music in general has inspiration sometimes struck when you least expected it you know i've talked with thousands of artists they say they come up with musical ideas while they're in the shower or they're doing groceries or they're doing their laundry or something like that has i'd imagine sometimes inspiration strikes at very inconvenient times right Usually that only happens when I'm stuck on something. If I'm working on a, on a piece of music, like I'll, I'll even use, I'll, I'll say there was a, a piece of music I was working on the other day. Um, I'm, I'm working with a new project that I can't quite discuss yet, but because it's so new, I'm still learning the parameters of who I'm working with and how they work. And so I know there's a certain expectation of me not to sound like I normally would with any of the other bands that I'm working with or I have already done. That being said, I'm trying to think and, and focus on a direction that works, that's that's new, but yet it's still interesting. So I was working on something and I was just, my mind was just gone. I, I could not come up with something that I felt would represent that body of music the way that the others I w I'm assuming would be expecting of me. So I walked away from it. But when I walked away from it, I've been listening to it so many times that it was just swimming in my head over and over. And then all of a sudden, these things were just flourishing and coming out of nowhere. Then I had to rush back into the studio to get them out because they weren't happening when I was just sitting there trying to do it. But when I walked away from it, it was still fresh in my mind. And all of a sudden, they just they were just flowing like crazy. And all of a sudden, I had the entire song done in 20 minutes. That's that's very impressive. And that's what what's kind of scary about artists in a way, like how sometimes inspiration could strike. Like I remember I, I've said this to in a lot of interviews, like everybody was so excited when Bruce Dickinson was flying the planes. I was very nervous. I was like, I hope he's not thinking of lyrics as he's like approaching the tarmac or something like that. <laughs> That's funny. That it is true. Yeah, that, but the, word, the the good thing is, you know, back in the day when you when inspiration struck, you had to be lucky enough to have like a tape recorder near you. Now with smartphones and all the gadgets and doodads that we have at our disposal, you're, there's never a, 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 a time that was that's inconvenient. There's always a way to jot down something so you don't forget it. And for the most part, I, I got to be honest with you. If I come up with something that I feel is really strong, I don't forget it. It's, yeah, it's it's easy to to kind of revisit it later because I did, I felt it was so strong that it, I didn't forget it. And 
the, the old days of having to put it down so you don't forget it are, are long gone for me because if that's if that idea feels that good and you remember it, then that means that was that was always meant to be. <laughs> and it's funny too because you mentioned like the smartphones. Uh, part of me. I, I'm sick to my stomach thinking about all the talented musicians from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s who may have had great ideas, but then they had one too many drinks or whatever, and then they woke up hungover and totally forgot that idea, and they didn't have it recorded anywhere. I'm starting to think that rock and roll heaven, but then there's also purgatory, what I call the realm of forgotten riffs or something. Right, right, right. That's, it's a great way to look at it because, sure, there's, there, there's – a lot of things that might have been or could have been that are gone forever because you didn't have the opportunity to get them to get them down or out there. But on the other hand, a good if, if there's enough good, then you don't have to worry about what could have been or what might have been because you have already what has been. I, I can't wait to see what's what's being written right now in rock and roll heaven right now with right. so many <laughs> like it, it just heaven's heaven is ten times louder. I could tell you that much. Oh God, yes. Yep. Now, when it comes to like though, like when it comes to like writing up the the writing the musical ideas and ri- not just the lyrics but the range and everything, do you prefer to maybe be in the company of your other bandmates in Wet? Do you no. like pref- okay? You like to be alone in isolation? I absolutely. I, I need to live with something on my own because when you're working on something, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like trying on new clothes. It's kind of like saying, "Oh, I want to try on these jeans. I want to try on this shirt," and because body types are different you, it, maybe a certain pair of jeans it looks they, they're too tight even though you got your size they're too tight they don't look good you don't want people to see you not looking good i don't want to see i don't want people to see my vulnerable side of when i'm creating something i don't want anybody in the room when i when i'm when i'm uh putting a, a vocal down for the first time and i'm trying different things or maybe my voice is cracking or something sounds so hokey or terrible that they're going to judge me go wow i would never imagine jeff would come up with something so hokey and terrible i want people to see the end result the, the, the final picture so as far as i'm concerned stay out of my lane stay out of my way and let me do what i feel is necessary when i feel it's it's uh, satisfactory to me. That's when I want you to hear it. Yep. And I feel so much more at ease and so much more creative that way than if somebody's looking over my shoulder or listening to all the all the, the, the cracks and wrinkles that occur until you get there. Yeah, you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen. You don't want telling you. You don't want somebody like just imagine if you're a chef and somebody's yelling at you that the steak isn't cooked well enough as you just put it in the frying or you pan. Put too much paprika or something. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's not necessarily that I'm the end all be all. It's just a natural sense of how what works for me when I create. I don't I don't want you to hear all the all the farts and and, and burps that occur in the creation. I just want you to hear the, the the final flow of how I hear it and what I think. And then you can give me your comments. You can say I think that sucks, or you could do better. All that's fine. The criticism you can give me after the fact, but I don't want you to hear what it took to get to that point. You definitely have some diehard fans who would love to hear the farts and burps that you <laughs> mentioned, though. So, like, you'd be amazed on what people are uh, interested in hearing in their music nowadays. Well, the, the great thing is, you know, with, with the uh, with digital files, you know, you're, everything is done with it, the old days. Everything was printed to tape, and to get access to those things, and and you know, the, those things were basically under lock and key. Nowadays, you. you you know, you send the file to an engineer to get something mixed. That file is, is floating around cyberspace forever. So, it, it, that's that's my thing. I don't want these these uh, these loose files that just that would normally just make you sound like the worst artist ever to be floating around. I I would rather have the final file that just sounds like so killer. But if you listen to it even without music, it just sounds killer. And that's that's just how I that's how I take. You ready for the most difficult question of the whole interview? Sure. It's about Ingve or Journey? It, neither. <laughs> neither. Neither. Right. It's about songwriting. Okay. How, how do you know when a song is done? When it feels good to me and I haven't overthought it. Again, as I already mentioned, I can take a song that we've listened to and known for the past 30 years and kind of rewrite or re retool new melodies behind it just because this is what i do this is what i do for a living this is how i do it i i don't overthink things i you give me a body of music without any melodies without any um any course 
and I will come up with something that I feel represents me, represents the song, and in the end, it's got to happen organically. Otherwise, thinking too much about it, it's, it's you know, if, if I'm sitting here just beating my brains trying to come up with something that, that everybody's going to like, or everybody's going to accept, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen that way. It's got to, I got to be able to come away with it organically and naturally. Otherwise, that, that just means it's, if you're, you're overthinking it, it's probably not going to be an, a good end result. Yeah, and the mind is, every artist is their own worst enemy. That's one thing every artist has in common, that their greatest enemy is, it's not what you're rebelling against, it's not what you're making a statement against, it's not, you know, the X that you're writing a song about. The greatest enemy for every artist is yourself. Right. And you're, you're not going to please everybody, you're not going to you're not gonna get everybody on, on board saying it's the best thing ever, but in the end, you got to make it the best thing ever in your eyes. And as long as you have that, at least you can walk away knowing you, you gave it your best shot. And, you know, I've, I've sung on over a thousand songs in my lifetime and written on pretty much three quarters of those. I, that doesn't make me a master songwriter. You can have one, two, a thousand hits. doesn't make you a master songwriter. It just makes you good at what you do, and it resonates with the people who are listening to it and buying it. And that's the bottom line. Absolutely. And the final question I wanted to ask you is, is as somebody who has seen you perform live uh, many times, it's always a great experience. But as I said with every artist, listening to the album is very different. Is a very different experience as simply watching an artist perform the material live. For you as a singer, because obviously, you know, the first goal is, you know, executing the material live. But do you almost feel that as like a front man too, there's almost like you have to practice like an essence of stage presence or crowd interaction in a way? 1,000% yes. And part of that reason comes from, and I had this this conversation earlier with another interview, uh, talking about in the early days of putting on a show, performing, but yet having the quality of, of what you do behind it. When I first started, especially like say for, with Ingbe, for instance, I was so manic with my stage show. I was so, I got to move, I got to do, I got to keep it interesting. I got to be doing this and that while I'm actually singing, delivering the vocals sometimes the vocals suffer from it. So you've got to learn and ration what you're doing and how you're doing it on stage. So the vocals come across as they're expecting them to be heard, but you're also entertaining them at the same, at the same time. And you learn those, those ins and outs, the, the confidence that comes with being a live performer by just, it's trial and error. I look back at old performances and I go, Oh, hey, how, how did I, and why did I do that to myself when I could have just, just chilled right here and deliver the best performance. And then when a song is like a little looser and easier vocally, where I'm not having to concentrate on breathing and remembering the words, I can do more. So of course, all that comes with experience. It all comes with the, the trials and the errors of touring. But for the most part, I've taken everything that I do. My heroes on stage were Prince, Freddie Mercury, and David Lee Roth, and even Paul Stanley for that matter. They knew how to keep you entertained, whether they were singing or whether they were just uh, doing intervals with different things to keep you entertained in between the, 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 the singing and the actual solos and such. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yes, uh, Oh, you're yeah. saying? No, no, go ahead. Oh, no, because like, there's some musicians who are a little bit more static on stage, and that's not a problem. Like, I'm a huge fan of Smashing Pumpkins, and like Billy Corgan doesn't necessarily you know, move too much on stage. He's not crowd-killing like some of the hardcore bands do. Uh, but then, you know, I love like a lot of death metal bands that, you know, like Corpse Grinder doing windmills t constantly and, you know, uh, uh, trolling some people in the audience, which is always hilarious. Um, <laughs> so, but, like, it, it, every frontman has... It's not just the voice that gives you your own identity, but I also feel like it's the way you present your voice that gives you your own identity as well well absolutely and and one of the one of the biggest uh influence i i had as far as a live performer was queen because queen were a completely different animal live than they were in the studio they weren't out to try and recreate everything they did in the studio when they played live they were two different bands completely and from that you could see a queen show and not miss all those layers of 64 harmonies and and all these crazy layers of guitar harmonies you could still watch and hear that band go oh my god that sounds as good if not better than the original versions because of the attitude the vibe and everything they put behind it when they were delivering songs that had all those different layers in the studio Absolutely. and that to me it was my that was my always my my go-to when it came to performing live you, you knew freddie mercury wasn't able he wasn't gonna be able to hit every nuance from like the, the slight
hate his falsetto y, breathy things live because it's live. And whether it's you're not having a great day vocally or they're just impossible for the microphone to capture that, they found ways to make sure that it came across just as strongly in a different way. And that was always my go to when it, when it came to being a live artist or performer. And you definitely succeed in that regard, let me tell you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so uh, before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed this discussion. Is there just anything else with the release of uh, the new Wet album that you would like to promote? Maybe like some live stream performances to hold the fans over or anything else you would like to plug? Sadly, no. We, we haven't discussed any of that kind of stuff. I mean, Wet's not necessarily a live entity anyways. We, we, we truly have a handful of shows under our belts as a band because this, for all intents and purposes, is a studio project that we're we're all part of that we enjoy making music together but it we're just far too busy with our other bands and our other focuses right now to to put this in a live format that that uh we haven't really discussed if and what we're going to do to promote the album outside of not being able to do shows so it's yet to be seen what we're going to do in, in the near future but for now there's not really anything but the actual album itself okay Fair enough, but thank you so much, Jeff. Everybody, we are here with Jeff Scott Soto. Be sure to check out the new Wet Album retransmission coming out January 22nd. Pick it up then when supplies last forever. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time.